that I will recognize myself for five minutes. On July 22nd, you joined the President as he announced the expansion of Operation Legend, an initiative... Let me start that again. On July 22nd, you joined the President as he announced the expansion of Operation Legend, an initiative to combat violent crime in Kansas City with approximately $61 million in DOJ grants. I am confused, however, as to the purpose of launching Operation Legend at this moment in time. In December of last year, you announced that the department would divert over $70 million in grants to seven U.S. cities under an initiative called Operation Relentless Pursuit, correct? That's right. And Operation Relentless Pursuit targeted a familiar list of cities, places like Albuquerque, Baltimore, and Kansas City, correct? Correct. At the same July 22nd press conference, you initially claimed that over 200 arrests had been had been made under Operation Legend, correct? Correct. At that, but you misspoke. Correct. The U.S. Attorney's Office for the Western District of Missouri later confirmed that only a single arrest had been made under the auspices of Operation Legend, correct? I, I don't know. And the uh, other, and the 199 other arrests were made under Relentless Pursuit or other programs. Well, that was correct. I think you could be forgiven for being confused. Operation Legend appears to be little more than a repackaging of existing operations in these cities. So why all the drama? Why join the President at the White House to announce a bold new operation that appears to be neither bold nor new? Understandably, Americans are very suspicious of your motives here. There are those who believe you are sending federal law enforcement to, into these cities not to combat violent crime, but to help with the President's re-election efforts. The President has made clear that he, wants con that he wants conflict between protesters and police to be a central claim, a central theme of his campaign. So let me ask you directly, Mr. Barr. Yes or no? Yes or no? Did you rebrand existing projects under the legend in order to assist the President in an election year? I wouldn't Mr. call it. I Mr. Wouldn't Attorney call it. General, yeah. would you agree with me at least on principle that it is improper for the Department of Justice to divert resources and law enforcement personnel in an effort to assist the President's re-election campaign? No, uh, Mr. Chairman, in the fall, we did inaugurate an anti-crime uh, initiative because we were concerned about increasing violent crime in a number of cities, and we called that relentless pursuit. Unfortunately, COVID intervened, and our agents who were detailed for these assignments could not perform uh, the operation. So the operation was squelched by COVID. So we couldn't complete uh, or make much progress on relentless pursuit. However, in the intervening time, we saw violent crime continuing to rise, and a lot of that was triggered by the events after uh, the uh, death of George Floyd. So we did reboot the program after COVID started breaking and our, we could commit the law enforcement resources to actually accomplish uh, the mission, which is to reduce violent crime. Now, I regret that COVID interrupted our law enforcement activities, but it doesn't obviate the fact that there is serious violent crime in these cities. These police and, and mayors from, have been asking us for help, and we have put in uh, additional federal agents and investigators to help deal with it. Have you, now, yes or no, have you discussed the president's re-election campaign with the president or with any White House official or any surrogate of the president? Well, I'm not going to get into my discussions with the president. Well, have you discussed that topic with him, yes or no? Not in, not in relation to this program. I didn't ask that. I asked if you discussed that. With I'm a member of the cabinet, and there's an election going so, on. Obviously, the topic so comes the up. So the answer yes. Well, the, the topic yes. comes up in cabinet meetings and other things. Shouldn't, okay. It shouldn't and be a surprise of, that, that the topic of the election comes. I didn't say I was surprised. I just asked if you'd done that. So as part of those conversations with the president uh, or his people about the re-election campaign, have you ever discussed the current or future deployment of federal law enforcement? In, in connection with what? In connection with what you just said, in connection with, the, with your discussions with the President or with other people around him of his re-election campaign, have you discussed 
the current or future deployment of federal law enforcement. Well, as I say, I'm not going to get into my discussions with the president, but I've made it clear that I would like to pick the cities based on law enforcement need and based on neutral criteria. So, but you, you can't tell me whether you discussed... No, I'm not going to discuss what I discussed with the president. Can you commit today that the department will not use federal law enforcement as a prop in the president's re-election campaign? We are not I using federal law enforcement. I just want to close with this thought. You really can't hide behind legal fictions this time, Mr. Barr. It's all out in the open, where the people can see what you are doing for themselves. The president wants footage for his campaign ads, and you appear to be serving it up to him as ordered. In most of these cities, the protests had begun to wind down before you marched in and confronted the protesters. And the protesters aren't mobs. They are mothers and veterans and mayors. In this moment, real leadership would entail de-escalation, collaboration, and looking for ways to peaceably resolve our differences. Instead, you use pepper spray and truncheons on American citizens. You did it here in Washington. You did it at Lafayette Square. You expanded to Portland. And now you are projecting fear and violence nationwide in pursuit of obvious political objectives. Shame on you, Mr. Barr. Can I just say, Mr. Shame on you. Can I just My say, time Mr. has expired. Uh, uh, for what purpose does Mr. Jordan see recognition? No, no, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Excuse could me. I just, could I just what have purpose a moment? Does Mr. My time has expired. For what purpose does Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Johnson see recognition? Questions for the witness, and I will yield the floor to him to respond. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, you, you've conflated two different things. The, the, the effort, like legend, uh, is to deal with violent crime, crime that's committing on the streets of the city. Again, predatory violence like murder shootings, which are soaring in some cities right now. Uh, that does not involve encountering protesters, as you refer to it. Civil disturbance is a different set of issues. And uh, I, I just reject the idea that the department has flooded anywhere and, and attempted to suppress demonstrators. We make a clear distinction between demonstrators. The facts speak well, for themselves. I'm, I'm, this I'm, is my time, I'm Mr. I'm answering. And, and you know, the fact of the matter is, if you take Portland, Portland, the courthouse is under attack. The federal resources are inside the perimeter around the courthouse, defending it from almost two months of daily attacks where people march to the court, try to gain entrance, and have set fires, thrown things, used explosives, uh, and uh, injured police, including just this past weekend, perhaps permanently blinding three federal officers with lasers. We are on the defense. It's, we're not out looking for, for trouble. And if the state uh, and the city would provide the law enforcement services that other jurisdictions do, we would have no need to have additional uh, marshals in the courthouse. On behalf of hundreds of millions of Americans, thank you for that clarification and thank you for being here. And thank you for your service today and uh, your willingness to do this in very challenging times. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, we're, we're very appreciative. It's not an easy job. It's a vitally important one. I so appreciated what you said in your opening statement today, which is what you said in your confirmation hearing. The Attorney General has a unique obligation. He must, he holds in trust the fair and impartial administration of justice. We appreciate that so much. The Democrats have asserted here this morning and they continue to say in the media that under your leadership, the Justice Department has become highly politicized. Why is that a totally unfounded allegation? Because actually what I've been trying to do is restore the rule of law. And the rule of law is, at essence, that we have one rule for everybody. If you apply one rule to A, the same rule applies to B. And I felt we didn't have that uh, previously at the department. We had strayed. And uh, I would just ask people, uh, I'm supposedly uh, punishing the president's enemies and helping his friends. What enemies have I indicted? Who, who, could you point to one indictment that has been under the department that you feel is, is unmerited, that, that you feel violates the rule of law? One indictment. Now, you say I helped the president's friends. The, the cases that are cited, the Stone case and the Flynn case, are both cases where I determined uh, that some intervention was necessary to rectify the rule of law, to make sure people are treated the same. I said all Stone was prosecuted under me. And I said all along, I thought that was a righteous prosecution. I thought he should go to jail. 
and I thought the judge's sentence was correct. But the line prosecutors were trying to advocate for a sentence that was more than twice anyone else in a similar position had ever served. And this is a 67-year-old man, first-time offender, no violence, and they were trying to put him in jail for seven to nine years. And I wasn't going to advocate that because that is not the rule of law. I agree the president's friends don't deserve special breaks, but they also don't deserve to be treated more harshly than other people. And sometimes that's a difficult decision to make, especially when you know you're going to be castigated for it. But that is what the rule of law is, and that's what fairness to the individual ultimately comes to, being, will to, will, being willing to do what's fair to the individual. Amen, and thank you for that. And by contrast, what the previous DOJ did under the previous administration was politicize law enforcement. The Obama-Biden administration sabotaged the Trump transition. They illegally spied on the Trump campaign. They unmasked members of the Trump campaign. They employed aggressive tactics on their, on their campaign officials. Senior FBI officials we all know on this committee carried over from the Obama administration uh, carried on their abuses into the Trump administration and into the whole impeachment scam and all the rest. Let me ask you just one question uh, because my time is running out. President Obama's Attorney General Eric Holder famously referred to himself as President Obama's wingman. He said in an interview, quote, I'm still enjoying what I'm doing. There's still work to be done. I'm still the president's wingman, so I'm there with my boy. That's what he said famously. Is it the duty of the Attorney General to be the president's wingman? No, I've already described what I think the duty of the Attorney General is. And, and in your office, you are then free to act independently of the President, isn't that true? That is true, particularly on criminal cases, it's required. And that's exactly what he has asked you to do, isn't that yes. right? Yes. I uh, have no further time, time I yield back. Thank you. It's well, you have no further questions, your time has expired. Uh, Ms. Lofgren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, it's obvious uh, what is happening here uh, from the video played uh, during the ranking members' remarks. It's clear that the president's playbook is to divert attention from his catastrophic failure in dealing with the COVID-19 situation. In Canada, our neighbor to the north, in Europe, the virus has re been reduced to such a level that people can safely go out and not worry about being infected. But here in the United States, millions of Americans have been infected. Tens of thousands are dying and the president needs to divert from that failure. And what is the playbook? The playbook is to create the impression that there is violence that he must send in federal troops and that the, that the American people sh uh, should be afraid of other Americans and trust the president because he's going to send in all troops to American cities. And that's how he hopes to win the election. You know, it's one thing to fight crime with joint task forces. That involves the cooperation of state and local officials. But the governor of Oregon and the mayor of Portland has asked that the federal troops leave because the reaction has actually been uh, in, in reverse proportion. People are showing up because the troops are there. And I'd like to say that so many of them, I would say most of them are uh, nonviolent. We've all heard about the wall of moms, the wall of moms who, who show up uh, to make sure that people are safe. And here's what they say. They say they've been tear gassed night after night, left vomiting, that they've been shot at with rubber bean bags, pepper spray. So this brutality has created even more demonstrators. I just like to ask you this. Uh, it, when the president issued his executive order, they indicated your department should prioritize investigations. Has your uh, department started any investigations pursuant to the executive order that the president issued? Which executive order, Congresswoman? The executive order that uh, asked for the deployment of uh, troops to uh, protect the monuments and the federal uh, facilities. Yes. The, the, On June 26th. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was troops, but the, 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 the uh, we have initiated investigations, yes. We've made arrests of people who, 
people who have who have been rioting and taken down uh, uh, statues. But I, I think your mis your characterization of Portland is completely false. Uh, we well, I would like to I would like to we can get into that, but I'd like to ask you a question about surveillance, if I may. Uh, we've heard reports that cell site stimulators known as stingrays or dirt boxes are being used to collect phone call location and even content of phone calls. Drones are being used that may have face recognition or cell phone interception technology and that there is bulk collection of internet browsing history. What specific authority is the department using for these surveillance tools? I, I really can't speak to the to to those instances if if they in fact occurred. I'm glad to go and, and try to determine what you're talking about. Well, actually, I'm asking about authority, not uh, the the details. Well, the, you know, the, I think the, most of our cyber activities are conducted by the FBI under their law enforcement powers to detect and prevent crime, federal crime. I think the American public should know that this surveillance technique is just about the people in, you know, in front of the courthouse. If a husband and wife call each other and one of the uh, spouses has a cell phone that's within range, of one of these uh, technologies, not only the location, but the actual content of that couple's conversation can be scooped up using this technology. So this really isn't just about the demonstrating. This is about the privacy of all Americans, and it's all being violated for the president's political purposes of trying to create a scene, create a reason, divert attention from the COVID Failure. I think it's really very unfortunate and a disservice to the American people. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. So the point, General, point of order. General lady Chairman. yields back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, purposes? point of order. Real quick. General Minister State is point of order. Could you ask those members who choose not to come to work to silence their cell phones on the video because it's distracting to what we're doing here today? That is not a point of order. The, uh, the, uh, I, I now recognize uh, Mr. Chabot. Mr. Attorney General, would it be accurate to say that it's this administration's responsibility, and of course you're part of the administration, to see that federal laws are upheld and that the federal property uh, is secure and safe and protected? Is, is that correct? <clears throat> That's right, Congressman. There are sort of distinct missions. One mission is to enforce federal law. And by the way, the federal government is the sovereign of the United States. We have two sovereigns here. Uh, in the United States, and we enforce the federal law all over the country. Every square foot of the country, we enforce federal law. The other is protecting federal property, and specifically U.S. courthouses, which are the heart of federal property in all 93 jurisdictions in the United States. And we have the obligation to protect, to, to protect federal courts, and the U.S. Marshals specifically have been given that obligation. Federal courts are under attack. Since when is it okay? to try to burn down a federal court. If someone went down the street to the Prettyman Court here, that beautiful courthouse we have right at the bottom of the hill, and started breaking windows and firing industrial grade fireworks in to start a fire, throw kerosene balloons in and, and start fires in the court, is that okay? Is that okay now? No, the U.S. Marshals have a duty to stop that and defend the courthouse, and that's what we are doing in Portland. We are at the courthouse defending the courthouse. We're not out looking for trouble. Thank you, General. And, and as far as weapons and devices that were utilized by the group of people, and, and you mentioned trying to destroy the courthouse. I mean, they were literally trying to burn it down uh, and apparently didn't give a hoot about the people that were occupied in the building as well. So people were in danger. Is that, that is absolutely right. So as far as the, the weapons that you mentioned, let me get this straight. Um, my understanding is that the, the people attacking the building had, among other things, rifles, explosives, knives, saws, sledgehammers, tasers, slingshots, rocks, bricks, lasers. Have, have I missed anything or does that about cover it? 
Um, you have missed some things, but that's a that's a good list. Well, well, but you know they have these powerful slingshots with ball bearings that they shoot. They've used pellet guns. We believe we have found uh, those uh, projectiles uh, at you know, have penetrated uh, marshals to the bone, uh, and they use the the lasers to blind the to, to blind the marshals. Um, they do start fires. They start fires if they can get in the fire inside or through the windows, and they start fires along the outside of the, the, pres of the, uh, the uh, courthouse. When the marshals come out to try to deal with the fire, they're assaulted. General, if, if local elected officials, mayors and city councils and governors did their jobs and kept the peace, uh, would it even be necessary for federal law enforcement personnel to be there in the first place? No, and that's exactly the point. Look around the country. Even where there are these kinds of riots occurring, uh, we, don't, we haven't had to put in the kind of re reinforcements that we have in Portland because the state and local law enforcement does their job and won't allow rioters to come and just physically assault the courthouse. In Portland, that's not the case. General, um, some have derisively referred to these law enforcement personnel as stormtroopers and worse. Does that accurately describe them? Or would you like to set the record straight? No, they're obviously not stormtroopers. You know, normally we would have a group of deputy marshals in a court that would be, uh, you know, in business suits and ties or regular uh, civilian dress. Those would be the deputy marshals as the protective force for the court. But after almost a month of rioting in Portland, you know, we sent in, I think it was around the 4th of July time frame, we sent in about 20 special operations uh, marshals. Uh, and those are tactical teams that are able, you know, are, are padded and protected so they could deal with this kind of thing. Up until last week, uh, I was told we had our, our stormtrooper from the Department of Justice amounted to 29 marshals in the courthouse. 29 marshals. As of last, uh, until recently increased, I think there were 95, I was told, uh, 95 DHS, and, uh, Federal Pro Protective Service and other DHS officers trying to protect the courthouse and three other buildings. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to protect federal functions and federal buildings, which are a very small part of the city, but the rioters go uh, at them, and, and we have gradually increased our numbers there to try to protect those uh, those facilities. If, if the state would come in and, and keep peace on the streets in front of the courthouse, we wouldn't need additional people at the courthouse. Thank you, General. My time's expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, before I begin, I'd like to submit into the record a picture of Lewis and Clark History Department Chair of Shot at Protests in Portland, as unanimous consent, place that into the record. John Lewis in 1963 said, we are tired about being beat by police. We're tired of being put in jail. We want our freedom now. Mr. Attorney General, in your remarks, you indicated that we've made great progress since that time. And you indicated that the killing of George Floyd was shocking. I disagree. It was outright cold-blooded murder on the streets of America unfortunately, by police misconduct. You seem to have a difficult time understanding systemic racism and institutional racism that has plagued so many. Mr. Attorney General, do you understand a black mother's or parent's talk to their child, to their son? Do you know what that is? I think I do. Uh, I don't know if you do, but Trayvon Martin, Ahmed Arbery, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Sean Bell, and George Floyd. Black mothers and fathers have had to talk to their sons about police violence. I take no backseat to the history of this committee that has stood for good policing, not misconduct. And so I ask you this question, does the Trump Justice Department seek to end systemic racism and racism in law enforcement? I just need a yes or no answer. To the extent there is racism in any of our institutions in this country and the police, then obviously this administration is, will, will fully enforce this. So you agree that there may be systemic racism? To the extent, in, in, in where? where? Uh, let me continue my line of questioning. I, I don't agree that there's systemic racism in the police department. Specifically. Generally in this country. 
and I'm reclaiming my time, Mr. General. Specifically, do you understand the violent impact of racial profiling, and do you support the end racial profiling, uh, racial and religious profiling in the George Floyd bill, including the removal uh, of the strict interpretation of qualified immunity, which would leave individuals like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd without any relief at all? No, I'm opposed to eliminating qualified immunity, and I don't agree that it would leave uh, the victims of police misconduct. Well, let me share with you some aspects. Without, without any remedy at all. I'm reclaiming my time. Let me share with you some aspects of uh, profiling. After the death of George Floyd found that while black people make up 19% of the Minneapolis population and 9% of its police, they were on the receiving end of 58% of the city's police use of force incidents. In addition, uh, we've seen uh, that uh, black men are twice as likely to be stopped and searched. Hispanic drivers, 65% to receive a ticket, uh, and Native Americans in Arizona, three times more likely to search and be stopped. Let me ask you the questions of how we respond to that. The Justice Department has many tools at its disposal to reduce police violence, the patent or practice investigations, a practice to end bad policing and, po and police violence. It addresses police violence at an institution level rather than just focuses on acute cases. If you understand that, then why has your department only pursued one pattern or practice investigation since President Trump took, took office that could stop systemic racism? The, if, if you read my statement or listened to my statement, I, I did specifically acknowledge that uh, there was a difficulty in this country uh, with the African-American community. Mr. Attorney General, I have a short time. Well, Can you just I, tell like me why you have answer, not done question. a pattern in practice? Uh, what was the reason? Uh, and you asked me what I thought the response was, and I thought the response to this is, in fact, training of police. Uh, and uh, I think the police believe that that's the response. I was talking to a black uh, then let chief me continue. of police. Mr. Who, Mr. Attorney General, I, I want to respect you, but I have a short time. You, you, for example, 18 U.S.C. Section 242, which makes unlawful the denial of rights under the color of law, can you defend the fact that in the first seven months of FY 2020, federal prosecutors filed only 242 charges, 242 charges in just 27 cases in the Trump DOJ? And were you aware uh, that in FY 2019, federal prosecutors brought two, Section 242 charges in just 49 cases in the United States? And do, are you aware of how many cases we've had, 184,274, which means that in FY 2019, only about 27 out of every 100,000 prosecutions was related to Section 200, 242 charges? Do you have a reason for that? Yeah, yes, I do. Uh, I will get you the numbers on it. I don't know them off the top of my head. But actually, our criminal prosecutions under 241 and 242 are, are extremely strong and are comparable to, if not exceed, prior administrations. But at the beginning of this year, most of the uh, very few jurisdictions had grand juries that were open. No grand jury. I think the reason is because it was really skinny. It was not your focus. Your focus was more to let out friends like Roger Stone and Paul Manafort, while Tamir Rice, whose case has not been taken up, was playing with a toy gun, was killed by police at the age of 12. Breonna Taylor was sleeping in her apartment when she was killed by police at age 26. And Rashad Brooks, 27, was killed just for sleeping uh, in his car in a Wendy's parking lot. And George Floyd from Houston, Texas, known as a humble man, was murdered in the streets of Minneapolis crying, I can't breathe. Uh, I would hope that the DOJ would focus on systemic institutional racism because there is good policing. That's what we're trying to do in the Justice and the Judiciary Committee, and that's what we need you to join us on, Mr. Attorney General, and to recognize that institutional racism does exist, and until we accept that, we will not finish our job and reach the goals and aspirations of our late, iconic John Lewis. The, With that, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, Mr. Uh, Gomer. Attorney General Barr, uh, we've been hearing about these peaceful protests in major cities around the, the country, controlled by Democratic mayors and city councils. You've had a lot of experience. Have you ever seen so many people hurt, injured, and killed at peaceful protests in your life? Uh, I, I, I haven't seen it, no, not at a peaceful protest. Uh, 
obviously, as I've said from the beginning, these peaceful protests ha in many places are being hijacked by a, a very hardcore of, of uh, instigators, violent instigators. And they, they become violent, and their primary uh, viol uh, direction of violence is to injure police. Police, well, police casualties far exceed anything uh, you know, on the civilian side. It, it, weren't, weren't there over 50 police injured in uh, Chicago just in recent days? It, it, and now I'm hearing this allegation that this administration uh, is helping spread uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, and yet these are some of the same people that just castigated the president for shutting down travel from the location where the virus was coming from. And now some seem more interested in defending the Chinese Communist Party than they are our own country. But uh, what occurred to me, hearing this allegation about this administration helping spread COVID, uh, would it be a good idea then perhaps if that's the big concern here uh, that maybe the federal government should shut down the protests during this COVID-19 uh, spread so that we can satisfy our colleagues that you're doing more to stop it? Has that ever been a consideration? No, I, I've never considered that. <laughs> well, it would apparently stop uh, some of the allegations being thrown here. Uh, now, I know you know history. Uh, Going back to 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Mao Revolution, uh, some of these tactics we're seeing are not new. Trying to get, even David Horowitz, I introduced one time as a former socialist, he said, no, I was a full-blown communist. But he has pointed out that he started looking away from the group he was in because he saw they were interested in trying to provoke the police to kill somebody so that they could really create mayhem. You're familiar with that tactic by Marxists, are you not? Yes. It is a dangerous time. Well, let me ask you, uh, I know you know that uh, U.S. attorneys are supposed to serve at the pleasure of the president. You know, Bill Clinton fired 93 U.S. attorneys on the same day uh, do you know what made U.S. Attorney Berman think that he was the exception who did not serve at the pleasure of the president? What caused him to think he owned that position? <clears throat> I think part of it was he seems to have had the view that because he was court appointed and there is a provision in law for court appointment of a U.S. attorney as essentially a placeholder until the administration hmm. uh, gets somebody. Uh, that he felt he could not be removed by the president yeah. because he was court appointed, and that's not correct. Yeah, and, and some um, judges fail to know what my constitutional law professor knew, and that is that all courts except federal courts except for one owe their existence and continuation and jurisdiction to the U.S. Congress. Uh, hopefully, uh, Mr. Berman will figure that out at some point. Now, uh, is Bruce Orr still working for the FBI? He works for the Department of Justice. Uh, well, we have heard so much information about his basically being the go-between between the DNC, the Clinton campaign, Fusion GPS, Christopher Steele, the Russian propaganda that uh, were incorporated into his dossier, and I know Klein Smith, uh, Christopher Ray indicated he had been um, given the chance to resign, go get a better job. I'm wondering how long Bruce Orr is going to be staying where he is. It, it, it's incredible to me that he's still there. Well, I can't talk about you know individual personnel matters. Well. Thank you for your service. I'm sorry for the abuse you've taken when you're just trying to do your job. Appreciate it very much. You're back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Barr, I'm the chairman of the subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties, so this is most pertinent hearing to me. Firstly, I'd like to ask you if you will uh, work with us and allow the head of the Civil Rights Division, Assistant Attorney General Eric 
uh, dry band to testify before this committee this fall. I'll talk to him about it. it we encourage him. I'll talk to him about it. All right. I've closely watched actions taken by the federal government in Lafayette Park in June and currently in Portland, Oregon. According to a DOJ document dated June 4, received by this committee, 1,500 federal agents from 10 different agencies were deployed to confront protesters in Washington, D.C. At Lafayette Park, which has long been honored and accepted as a place of protest in our nation's capital, on the first day of June, the world watched in horror on live television as federal agents deployed by the administration and with you present and telling him to get it done, used force to clear Lafayette Park so that the president, with you and others at your side, could walk across the park and have a photo op in front of St. John's Church. This was anathema to the bishop of the diocese and the rector of the church. It was also an affront to the Constitution and to the American people. Given the timing and the coordinated attack against the peaceful demonstrators, it strains credulity that this was not planned for use of political purposes. And just yesterday, Major DeMarco testified to another committee of Congress that the protesters were peaceful, and that's what the ma most, the majority of people have said, and the response was excessive. When did you first learn that the president planned to walk through the park and go to St. John's Church? First, I'd like to respond to what you Let, said. Would you please answer my question? My time is limited. I learned, uh, sometime in the afternoon that the president uh, might come out of the White House, and then later in the afternoon I heard that he might go over to the church. So it was absolutely necessary the park be cleared for his, for his walk. No, that's, that had nothing to do with that. The plan to move Mr. The, Mr. The plan General, to move the it was necessary that the park be cleared and it was done, and you said, get it done. Well, I, I, I have the time. Thank you. In Portland, we've seen mothers and we've seen veterans who were peacefully protesting, not threatening the federal courthouse, beaten and gassed. Unidentified armed federal agents violently attacked demonstrators in a violation of the First Amendment's freedom of assembly and arrested citizens without individualized suspicion in a violation of the Fourth Amendment's protection against unreasonable searches and seizures and a warrant requirement. You've gone through the Fifth Amendment and due process and just negated it. And the Tenth Amendment, which leaves general policing to the law enforcement, to the states, has been forgotten. Maybe what happened was your secret police were poorly trained just like your Bureau of Prisons guards were poorly trained and allowed the most notorious inmate in our nation's last several years, Jeffrey Epstein, to conveniently commit suicide. Sad. You misled Congress and the American people about Special Counsel Mueller's findings with your quote summary, unquote, of his report. It was issued about a month before you released the redacted portion of the Mueller report. But you set the stage. You set the stage such that the special counsel objected to the accuracy of how it was reported by the press and what you said. And federal judge Reggie Walton, appointed by George W. Bush, declared in a ruling that your summary was, quote, distorted, unquote, and misleading, unquote, and that the court could not trust you. Further, Judge Walton stated that your report was, quote, a calculated attempt to influence public disclosure about the Mueller report in favor of President Trump, unquote. This committee still does not have the unredacted Mueller report. America has still not seen the unredacted Mueller report. Your excuses for not releasing it because it had to do with ongoing cases no longer exist because those ongoing cases have been completed or commuted or finished. Other attorney generals work with this Judiciary Committee to see that the American public and that the Judiciary Committee had unredacted copies of that report. You have not. You've gone to court to stall it. This report needs to be given to this committee. And Michael Cohen, you've treated him differently than Michael Flynn and Roger Stone. And Michael Flynn, you've attempted to dismiss the charges, even after he twice pled guilty. And in Roger Stone, you went further. Mr. Barr, John Lewis said to us, if not me, who, if not now, when? That's why I introduced HRS 1032, which would require this committee to investigate your conduct as Attorney General and determine whether you should be impeached. That is my constitutional duty. I yield back the balance of my time. May I respond to these? I have to seek recognition. I'm sorry, what did you? I would the, like to, to I would like to seek Mr. recognition Cohen. for unanimous consent requests. Yes. 
You're Thank you. I'd like to introduce for the record a Slate article entitled, Why Trump Chose Portland, which describes the racial history of the state and the Portland Police Bureau. I'd also like to introduce an op-ed from Mary McCord, who writes, her words were twisted to justify the department's disingenuous position to drop charges against Michael Flynn after he had already pled guilty. I'd like to introduce an op-ed from Jonathan, Jonathan Cravis, describing the political interference in the Roger Stone case and why he resigned from the Department of Justice. And I'd like to introduce a statement from over 2,600 former DOJ officials calling for Attorney General Barr's resignation because of his assault on the rule of law. And a letter from the New York City Bar urging Congress to commence formal inquiries into a pattern of conduct by Attorney General Barr that threatens public confidence in the fair and impartial administration of justice. And finally, a letter from 27 of the District of Columbia's most prominent attorneys and law professors, including four past presidents of the D.C. Barr, calling for an ethics investigation into Mr. Barr's conduct. And With that last suggestion. but not least, a letter from over 80 percent of the George Washington University law school faculty, your alma mater, saying his actions have posed to continue to create a clear and present danger to the even-handed administration of justice, to civil liberties, and the constitutional order. Okay. Without objection. Thank Madam you. Chair, one more the unanimous consent request. On this Go side, ahead. this is the article that says Representative Jerry Natler says Antifa violence in Portland is a myth. That's from Politico and a number of other journals. Without we'll that objection, the Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Attorney General Barr. Wow, I, I'm beginning to believe, frankly, that you're probably the that just hadn't come out yet. Probably will in a little bit. You're probably the cause of the common cold and uh, you know, and possibly even the COVID-19, I'm not sure at this point, because everything's being thrown at you, including now, undoubtedly your alma mater doesn't like you anymore. Where, where have we come? The chairman said something earlier today that really made me think. He said, why all the drama? That's the most ironic statement coming from this committee in the last 18 months that I've ever heard of, the drama that we're bringing up today. We're, we're, we're seeming to just contort ourselves to get to uh, some way to show that you have nefarious motive. I believe, uh, like some of our side here, I believe the biggest problem you have is telling the truth. I believe that's the problem that they have with you. You'll tell the truth and you'll take responsibility for your actions and I think that's why you're being attacked. But I wanna continue just on this quote peaceful protest for a second. You made a comment just a second ago on these rights. It, talking about the courthouses just down the street, what if they decided, do you think that this body right here would rise up if they decided to go tonight and paint the Capitol building? This body, I'm not sure. I think this side would. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, this side, other side, I'm not so sure. It may be the peaceful protest to burn down the Capitol. Maybe we're back to 1812 again. Yeah. But also, it, the other question I have is, and you've heard it earlier today, the stormtrooper comments by the Speaker of the House. And we know that that is a direct uh, reference to the paramilitary wing of the Nazi party. Stormtroopers going at it. Do you believe that that actually puts our law enforcement community at a whole? As a son of a state trooper, I, I want to know your opinion. Does it, don't you think it encourages the violence that we're seeing and encourages the participation against the police? I think that's possible, and I think it's irresponsible to call these federal law enforcement officers stormtroopers. Yeah, and we're seeing that thing played out over and over. Let's switch back to something else, though, that is, is I think, more appealing here. We've talked about the investigations, and uh, especially with going with Flynn. Do you believe that there was actually a basis to go after General Flynn? I mean, what we've seen so far, what's been released, and especially keeping an, a, an investigation open, Peter Strzok kept it open. Do you believe there's actually a basis for the beginning of this investigation to start with? Are continuing it well I would just say I, I asked uh, another US attorney in st. Louis who had 10 years in the FBI and 10 years in the Department of Justice as a career prosecutor to take a look at it and and he determined based on documents that had not been provided to Flynn's side and not been provided to the court that in fact there was no basis to investigate okay. Flynn and well, furthermore it was clearly established by the documents that the FBI agents who interviewed him did not believe right. that he thought he was lying. Well, there's another part of this as well that concerns uh, what has been you know, given to the courts and, and the interviews, and that is that the facts were not disclosed to Flynn prior to the interview. We're talking, do you, that seems like a Brady violation to me. Do you believe that, that was, there's a Brady violation there in this case? No, there wasn't a Brady been. violation there, but I think what the uh, counsel concluded was that the only purpose of the interview, the only purpose, was to try to catch him in, in saying something that they could then say was a lie. So it was an entrapment. And therefore, and, and therefore there was not a, a legit, it, the, the interview was untethered to any legitimate uh, 
investigation. So as the law enforcement officer in this country, it is your responsibility to provide justice for both sides, not, you know, and, and just call it as it should be. And I think that's what you've done there. Uh, continuing on Durham case, and I know we're not talking specifically about the Durham investigation, which we're hopeful of, but to your knowledge, uh, um, and we're seeing some release documents in the last uh, week or two that have said, to your knowledge, has Kevin Kleinsmith or anyone else at FBI or DOJ attempted, who was previously there, attempted to redeem themselves by cooperating with the investigation? I, it's been slow, and I'm I, just I can't get into that. Okay. I understand that. I have another issue as we finish up in looking at this between the rhetoric, between the investigation. I think Durham investigation is something most of us are waited for because we can't seem to get this committee to actually believe that the IG's report is worth having something about this committee. And there's not a Democrat or Republican on the side that can make a legitimate claim why the Inspector General has not been called before this committee to actually explain his report except politics. And that's what this committee has become all along. But I have another problem, and I've talked to you, I've written to you about this, um, and that's down with a district attorney down in Fulton County, Georgia, actually charging, uh, making felony murder charges uh, on an officer. And the interesting part about this is what we do as, as, as prosecutors do, but the, were you aware that the district attorney failed to seek an indictment from a grand jury or even waited for a GBI investigation to finish before bringing those charges? Were you aware of that? Yes, I was. Okay. As an attorney, and again, looking at this, with the, the environment we have right now with police officers constantly under attack from, from this committee and from others and all over the country, and especially from the Speaker of the House, as an attorney and especially a prosecutor, do you think it's appropriate to charge a law enforcement officer with a crime as severe as felony murder without giving the investigation more than a mere days and without obtaining a, an indictment from the grand jury? And while you announce the charges, lay out a case that is full of falsehoods. I've said that I, I would have preferred and, uh, that he had used the grand jury and had waited till the Georgia Bureau had completed its investigation. Well, I appreciate your help in that, and with that, I yield back. Thank you. With that, the chair recognizes uh, Ms. Mr. Johnson from Georgia. Thank you. Uh, General Boy, your opening statement reads like it was written by Alex Jones or Roger Stone. Do you oh. stand by that statement? Yes. Now, I'm sure that we can agree on some things we disagree on a whole lot, but I'm sure we can agree on the fact that President Trump is just a prolific tweeter. Isn't that correct? He seems to be. And he tweeted many times about the Roger Stone sentencing, didn't he? I don't know how many times he tweeted about it. Well, many times, you, and you are aware of them because you said it would, it's hurts you from doing your job. And isn't it true that when prosecutors in the Roger Stone case filed a memo with the court recommending a sentence of seven to nine years in prison. A few hours later, President Trump tweeted that the sentence recommendation was, quote, a disgrace. You're aware of that? Yes. And General Barr, several hours after that, you filed a pleading with the court stating that the sentence recommendation would be changed and that you would be asking for a lighter sentence for Roger Stone. Isn't that correct? No, but, no, what is correct is that, well, er, 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 what is correct that on February 10th, Monday, no, no, I gave no, instructions no, no. as to what the... Reclaiming my time. Yeah, reclaiming I'm answering time. your question. Well, you got to let him answer. Re reclaiming my time, you filed a sentencing recommendation hours after President Trump tweeted his dissatisfaction with the Stone recommendation, and you changed that recommendation. No, I direct, the night before, Trump the tweeted. night before... That is well, Monday I, night. I, I know your story, but I'm asking. Well, you. I'm telling my story. That's well, what I'm here to do. To tell you well, story. I do. I That's why I'm here. My question. Well, I'm here to tell my story. Well, and on the night before, the night before on February 10th, well, sir, on February I, 10th, I directed. Reclaiming my time, sir. Reclaiming my time. And I know you don't want to answer, but the facts are clear. Sentencing recommendation made in the morning, tweet. In the afternoon, you changed the sentencing recommendation that... No, tweet, tweet was not made in the afternoon. The tweet was made at, I think, 1.30 or 2 in the morning. Well, the tweet was made before and after. Tweet tweeted about that relentlessly, and you've agreed to that. Now, when you filed your sentencing recommendation asking for a lower sentence... I didn't ask for a lower sentence. Well, you said that you were going to recommend a lower sentence... And you see, no, I let, what, we, wasn't the sentence that was recommended by the line prosecutors according to the sentencing guideline calculations? 
It was within it was within the guidelines, but it was not within Justice so, Department policy, so in now, my view. General Barr, you're expecting the American people to believe that you did not do what Trump wanted you to do when you changed that sentencing recommendation and lowered it for Roger Stone. You think the American people don't understand that you were carrying out Trump's? I was not. I, I had not discussed my sentencing recommendation with anyone at the White House or anyone, exactly or anyone exactly outside what the, the department. Wanted you to do, and that's what you did. No, now, I, well, Let me ask you: Do you think it's fair? Do you think it is fair for a 67-year-old man to be sent to prison for seven to nine years? It was in accordance with the sentencing. No, it was not. You just said that it was. And your line prosecutors I, will testify that it was also. Now, I'm going to move on from that. The department During your time as attorney it general is not the for Herbert Walker Bush, you never changed the sentencing recommendation for a friend of uh, Herbert Walker Bush, did you? No, I, as I recall. All right. I, uh, that's all I'm asking. Not, no. And over the course of your time as Trump. It was, nothing was never elevated to me. Over the course of your tenure with Trump, You've changed two sentencing recommendations, not one, but two, which correct? Were, which were they? Yeah, Michael Flynn. I didn't change it. Well, you said, well, you indicated that, um, you, yeah, you changed it because the original Flynn sentencing recommendation was for Flynn to serve zero to six months. But under your authority, the Justice Department supplemented that recommendation with a pleading that stated the Department of Justice's agreement with Flynn's lawyers that probation would be a reasonable sentence and that the DOJ would not be sinking prison time for Michael Flynn. Isn't that correct? I don't think that's what it said. Well, that's what it said, sir. You go back and read it. I, I, now, think, prior, both, I think both pleadings now, sir, said that. Reclaiming my time, prior to you becoming The gentleman's a time has expired. Madam Chair, you, you, can, you can give a speech or you can ask questions. If you do the latter, you need to let the witness answer the questions. And that's the chair's obligation, it, chair's responsibility to allow that to happen. Mr. Buck is recognized for five minutes. Attorney General Barr, thank you for appearing before the committee today. General Barr, there is a disturbing pattern we've seen throughout history with totalitarian systems of government. The leaders first seek to disarm the population, then they encourage goon squads to suppress opposing voices. And finally, once they have disarmed and silenced the opposition, these authoritarian leaders institute policies that root out and crush freedom in every form. Unfortunately, the American left has been infected with the same totalitarian desire to remove firearms and silence opposing views as part of a campaign to achieve its political ends. We've seen this scenario play out in every major Democrat-run city in America. Progressive leaders push to disarm law-abiding Americans to further their influence while watching as crime rates soar. We even saw failed presidential and Senate candidate Beto O'Rourke proudly tell Americans, hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15 and your, AR, or your AK-47. Now the American left is actively cheering as its fascist militia Antifa rages in the streets. Antifa is a domestic terrorist organization that hijacks peaceful rallies, organizes armed riots, attacks peaceful protesters, burns buildings, loots stores, and spreads hate. Reports of Antifa-linked attacks began circulating in 2017. These thugs, often armed with sticks and pepper spray and other, uh, other instruments, showed up to silence college Republican groups at Berkeley. The left was silent. Then in June 2019, Antifa jumped into the national conversation after journalist Andy Ngo was brutally attacked in Portland. No arrests were made. The left again was silent. Almost exactly one year ago today, the Wall Street Journal ran an op-ed stating, Portland has to do something to deter political violence or the city will get more of it. Of course, the city's feckless leadership has only further encouraged Antifa's violent annex. As a result, we've seen 61 straight nights of violence in Portland. Antifa's fascist totalitarian activities are now oozing into other Democrat-run cities. Last Sunday, Antifa launched a violent assault on a peaceful pro-police demonstration in Denver, Colorado. Conservative leaders in Colorado, including Randy Corporan, a Denver area lawyer and radio talk show host, organized a family-friendly event 
in honor of Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. The atmosphere was peaceful, and the counter-protesters were given plenty of space to advocate their message. But as the afternoon wore on, a swarm of violent Antifa thugs infiltrated the peaceful Black Lives Matter counter-protesters and began assaulting pro-police Americans. These are 20 and 30-year-old thugs assaulting 50, 60, 70, and even 80-year-old Americans who only wanted to show their support for law enforcement. What's worse, Denver's cowardly liberal leadership ordered police to retreat once they saw members of Antifa entering the fray. A Denver police detective, Nick Rogers, apologized for this terrible decision. Detective Rogers summed it up best in a recent radio interview, quote, I'm sorry on behalf of the rank and file. That's not us. That's not who we are. It just kills me that we let good people down. He continued, I found out that a retreat order was given by the incident commander, and we had one lieutenant step up and say, we aren't leaving. This lieutenant said, these people are going to get killed if we don't stay. So he kept his people there. That's the reason this thing didn't get worse, end of quote. These are sad times in America. Free speech and the right to keep and bear arms are both being threatened by violent anarchists, and the best our chairman can do is call Antifa a myth. General Barr, this has to stop. We can't let Antifa continue terrorizing our country. Can you please tell us about the appropriate use of civil and criminal RICO statutes to address violent criminal groups like Antifa? In the, uh, in the wake of the, the beginning of these riots, uh, I asked our joint terrorism task forces, the FBI's joint terrorism task forces around the country, uh, to uh, be our principal means of developing evidence and prosecuting uh, violent extremist terrorists who are involved in these activities. And one of the tools obviously we would use is RICO, which can be used against an organization. But that doesn't mean that we currently have a RICO case uh, pending. Okay, I, I thank the uh, gentleman. And, and uh, do you have anything you want to say in response to the speeches that have been given by the other side and, and then you've been cut off? Yeah, well, let's, on Lafayette, on Lafayette. The gentleman's time has expired. Okay. Can I ask for a brief recess? Yeah, Madam Chair, the witness like a break. Yes. Uh, um, Mr. Barr. Mr. Barr. Mr. Barr. Ten, Ten minutes. minutes for a brief. Ten minutes. Five. Okay. Recess for five. Minutes. We're the committee will stand in recess for five minutes.